Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and welcome to JCB Live. This is mid-December, and dear friends, you up for an amazing treat. Four times James Beard Award winner, one of the most incredible chefs that the American world has ever seen, one of the most amazing philanthropists of all time, who's created a wholesome wave phenomenal company as well. The man who assisted Paul Newman in many of his endeavors philanthropically as well. Mm -hmm. The man who really built restaurant in India, in America and many other places around the world. The man I met by pure accident at Dickie Brennan, big owner of major restaurant in New Orleans a few weeks ago. And we hit it off with his beautiful daughter, Courtney, and they run an incredible business. And they are the people who know how to give back to others and make food the centerpiece and how it's made, how it's produced, and more importantly, to give back and educate others along the way. So I'm excited. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> there's no better way to bring you, Michael, to the team. Yes, indeed. <laughs> that was fabulous. Oh, look at this. I love it. And my phone is still working. <laughs> oh, oh, you got your phone. Oh, fabulous. Well, phone, computer, everybody got the phone. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> fabulous. Cheers. Tisante. Mm. So, Michelle, we met Serendipity. We did not know we would meet at Dickie Brennan's house. And we had an amazing time. I would like for you to give all our friends from all around the world a quick synopsis of how you feel, before we get into all your achievement, how you feel you became who you are today. Um, you know, it's, it, it was it, it, like for so many of us, so many of us Joan Shallow, it's, um, it, it's a life journey, but my, both of my parents were farmers. Uh, they, they grew up raising food. Um, my mom's family, especially every one of my aunts and uncles were expert cooks and animal husbandrists and, and butchers and cures and canners and picklers. So I grew up knowing what a beautiful ripe tomato was and what an heirloom breed of pig was and was, was just lucky to be exposed to that at, at a young, young age. So I fell in love with food one of the most important things my mother taught me was that you could actually love people through food uh, in the exchange of that that hospitality. And it, it, it informed everything that I do to this day. Um, I, just, I do remember I, I really wanted to be a musician, um, but my mom and dad fell on hard times financially when I was graduating high school. And my mother said, Michelle, you're a very good cook get a job in a restaurant, at least you'll eat. And that's exactly what happened. And that's how my career <laughs> began. So I find myself here today. And I think a lot of it is because many of the chefs that I worked with over time, really, the one thing that they knew about me was that I, I, I really was genuine about wanting to please other people and that I had a deep reverence and respect for the food that I was touching and serving. So, so that's, I, I think that's, that's what uh, food makes me who I am. That's amazing. And that makes me think of the big quote. Tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. You know, Bria <laughs> Savarin, as you know. So maybe we start at multiple levels of your life. Uh, before you started your own firm, you helped a man, as I alluded to, uh, named Paul Newman, who is a close friend of yours, as well as the family. He's no longer with us, but looking at all the things you helped me to do, him, him to do. So give us an idea of what you've done together and how you did it. Because I think this is amazing to be able to use the celebrity of a great actor, provide amazing food, and at the same time, give back to society. Well, so uh, I, I've known Nell Newman for quite some time. She lives out there in Santa Cruz, uh, California. And uh, it was back in the early 2000s, uh, her, her father was bound and determined to, to finally get into the restaurant business. What a lot of people don't know about the Newman's Own brand was that he, originally he wanted Newman's Own to be a restaurant, 
Um, but his business managers wouldn't let him open a restaurant. So, so <laughs> decades passed of him selling salad dressing uh, and pizza sauce and all of the food products um, that you can now find in a retail grocery store and then giving 100% of the profits to charity. Wow. Uh, but when it, when it was time for him to him and his wife, Joanne Woodward, to really save the Westport Country Playhouse, which is, yeah. the, this is the playhouse where actors first produce their work in the United States. It's where the play My, My Fair Lady was born, Oklahoma was born there, um, just a wonderful place. They, they had a capital campaign to save it. And there was always a little restaurant next door. And yeah. Paul said, to hell with my managers, I'm opening up a restaurant. And Nell immediately reached out to me and said, can you please help my father with this restaurant? So after, after honestly, a couple of years of courtship, um, because I, I, I had a restaurant that I was opening in India, we ended up becoming 50-50 partners in dressing room restaurant in Westport. Uh, wow. Connecticut, which was um, a restaurant that was local, organic, sustainable. We had the had farmers markets in our parking lots, created food hubs to support local producers, and all of that good stuff. So you know, I I really you know to say that one falls in love with a human being like Paul Newman is a monumental understatement because he's one of the finest souls that ever lived. Uh, but to be able to work with him and understand his thinking and the fact that if you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and have the right color eyes and, <laughs> and do really well for yourself, that as long as you're willing to share it and make sure that others can come along with you, uh, that's the premise of his life. So when you look at that Newman's own brand, having given away almost $600 million in 30 years wow. uh, uh, to charitable causes, selling good food. You know, I, I think it's a tremendous model for, for a, lot of, um, a lot of entrepreneurs and American business people to consider, especially when we look at some of the society's vexing problems that we all face today. <laughs> so well said. And so Michelle, uh, you a major entrepreneur yourself. So you helped, obviously, Paul Newman mm -hmm. in his phenomenal enterprise. I want to dive quickly into, well, not quickly, because it's a major <laughs> undertaking as well. Well, that's okay. You know, we have plenty of wine, jean <laughs> That's right. Well, what do you think of this? Because it's delicious. It's spectacular. You're a great wine taster. I tasted a lot of wines with you that a few yes, weeks we, ago. Yes, we, we had quite a bit. Uh, I just... I, I just love that just the the very very simply sophisticated elegance of 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 this of of this wine. It is it's got that that kind of brut quality that brings in kind of like this floral peanutty um, caramely little bit of whisper of fun, you know, as well as elegance. I mean, it's delicious. This is obviously, you know, if, if you're ever in doubt of what to serve with any food, sparkling wine and champagne are a good way to go. This is very, very well made. And the Brut Rosé is, is equally spectacular as well. We had both that day at Dickie's house and I, I fell in love with it. So thank you so much for sending more along. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. And, you know, for you who love spice and Indian food, uh, you probably already figured it out. We're quite successful with 69 and 21 in India because of exactly what you described mm. with all the fabulous uh, spectrum of flavors in Indian cooking. So, but what, what I would love for you to explain us is as a great chef, as a fabulous entrepreneur, how with your daughter as well, you, you've built this great new business of yours and what it entitles and how you do it. Because a lot of our friends today with us around the world, it's a new year coming in 15 days. We're wondering, okay, we're getting into 2022. It's a new era. Of course, we've lived new challenges and new opportunities. Mm. And you all along your life have done so well, thanks to your understanding of sensory, to keep building great things for you and for others. Mm. So tell us about your new fantastic organization and the wave you're building. Okay, so I, I will start with Wholesome Wave, 
which I actually founded when when Paul and I, when Paul was still alive and Dressing Room was alive, um, founded Wholesome Wave in 2007 uh, wow. with encouragement from Paul. So this is a, a 501c3 nonprofit organization where we wanted to raise private money to prove what would happen if public money, tax dollars were spent differently. And yep. to, to your point, because for me, it's all about food and sensory and taste and flavor and and being able to serve people well, there are over 50 million Americans who can't do that. It just, That's right. it, it can't be part of their daily life because they're struggling with such poverty and low income that, that they, they actually face what we call food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. So I found it Wholesome Wave to solve that. So we started by raising private money um, it, through the form of grants. Uh, Paul, Paul uh, gave us a gift of $185,000 to start Wholesome Wave. And then we started raising money from other people and we used the money to double food stamps, which is a, a form of federal food assistance for someone who's struggling with poverty so they can at least feed their family. We started doubling people's food stamps if they would buy fruits and vegetables from local wow. farmers markets and grocery retailers. And we, we proved that if somebody is struggling with poverty, but they have a financial resource that can only be spent on delicious, healthy food, they will by all means go and spend it on delicious, healthy food, which creates a positive economic impact for farmers, for participating markets and retailers. So Wholesome, Wholesome Wave was the first thing that I founded. That's the wave. Uh, we succeeded twice with federal policy, um, getting uh, a program called the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, named after Gus Schumacher, my late co-founder of, of, of Wholesome Wave, uh, in, embedded in federal policy. So we do that. But jean Charles, it's like anything else. You get a big idea and you find out that the problem you're trying to solve is even bigger than the idea. Uh, so we knew. Yeah, but you, you, you know why I commend you, Michel, so much on it is you were determined. You had the vision and you executed on the idea. And that's what I really want to relate ah, to all the you. people with us today is you have all those great ideas, but you actually do it. So, yeah, yeah I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, going, no, it's OK. It's actually that's a big that, deal. When, many when people it, abandon it half of the time yeah. because it's too many hurdles to go through. Well, you know, it, it, it's so funny that you would say that because there were some friends of mine in what we call here in the United States, the good food movement. Yeah. Um, who who I had known for quite some time. And one, a dear friend of mine, Joan Gussow, who who uh, works with Columbia University, is a professor emeritus of environmental nutrition, really, really brilliant uh, mentor. And I remember when I was describing what I wanted to do with Wholesome Wave and that we were actually going to be audacious enough to get policy change. And she said, Michelle, I know that your organization is going to be great. You're going to help a lot of people, but I know how you are. I just don't want you to be heartbroken when you don't achieve policy change. That was a fun phone call to make <laughs> when we actually yeah. got the policy change. So it, there were some there were some barriers. I mean, when we started doubling food stamps for fruits and vegetables, it was actually illegal, which is one of the things that Paul loved about it. He's like, oh, great. We're going to do something that's not approved by the government. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, it was, it was a little bit risky, but, you know, we really believed in the idea. And I think to your point, John Charles, is, you know, when somebody has an idea um, yeah. and, and you really, really believe in it and, and you're going to put yourself into it, you, you, no matter how big barriers may seem or something pops up along the way that all of a sudden makes it seem like maybe it wasn't such a good idea, maybe it's impossible, you really must stick with it. You really must stick with it because well, it, it's that fortitude that makes the journey when you finally succeed so much more valuable and rich. Such a great advice. Now, what made you, you as Michelle, as this great fabulous chef, wanted to give back so much and wanted to be so involved in this program of of really donating your life really for others because yes you you do well and but you really committed yourself to others yeah well you know it just again i i think i i told you that my mother 
you know, one of the most valuable lessons that she taught me was that you could love people through food. Yeah. And which is something that I always just made me feel really good about being alive until I learned how many millions of Americans couldn't do that. That's that, right. That's just not, that's not fair. It's not right in that's the society right. that we have, you know, based on the constitution written up by our founding fathers, everybody should have the right to feed their families well. Um, it, it, it's a right. It, everybody should have a right to a ripe tomato, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. or, you know, just, you know, just like everybody should have a right to beautiful flowers and to watch the sunrise, to watch the sunset, know that their children are going to go to bed tonight, well fed, they're going to wake up tomorrow morning, and the world's going to be maybe a better place tomorrow than it was today. And when, when you can't provide that, just a good meal, a good comforting meal for your family, that you can become hopeless very quickly. Yeah, the, the, the power being able to provide your family with a good meal, a good, comforting, delicious meal uh, that's culturally appropriate for you. If you can't do that, you feel like a failure. I, I just, I could, I actually couldn't sleep, Jean, Jean Charles, when I learned about that's amazing. The, the fact that it, at the time when I learned about it, it was 38 million Americans who relied on the SNAP or the food stamp program. And today close to 50 million Americans rely on it. So it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it is crazy. It's a lot. That's a lot of people who can't put good food on the table. So, you know, uh, I think, you know, any of us who was raised by our parents to be a good neighbor should be bothered by something like that. But more, yeah. more, more importantly, if you've got the wherewithal and you got the knowledge and you got some good ideas, do something about it. Now, you know what I love in addition to all that? So, dear friends, you got to realize I met Michelle with our friend Dickie Brannon, who owns five mm -hmm. phenomenal restaurants in uh, New Orleans and who is part of the James Beard. And they're all part of this amazing food vision for America. Michelle is with his gorgeous daughter. One, she's gorgeous. Two, extremely sharp. And three, very talented. And... Michelle, you instilled in your daughter that sense of education as well. And I saw that immediately. Oh. She proposed to prepare a beautiful plate for us as we we're having <laughs> wine. Dickie pulled out a 1945 to celebrate the end of World War II. Yep. And you know, the war museum that Gina and I just had mm. seen and she volunteered to prepare that beautiful plate and we all sat and talk about it. How did you instill in your family and children such a phenomenal sets of values because it's impressive to observe. Well, th that's very kind. And thank you, Jean Chau. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, my wife and I met in the business. Um, it was actually the first restaurant I was ever a chef at was in, in 1981 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin called the Fleur de Lis. And my, my front of the house partner had hired my wife to, to work the host stand. Yeah. Um, it was a very, very popular, busy restaurant. And I rarely could go out into the dining room because the constant kitchen was constantly getting slammed. And all of a sudden, over the course of a couple of weeks, everything started leveling out. And at first I thought, maybe we're, are, are, are we not busy anymore? And so I go to the end of the night and say, Kent, did we do less covers tonight? Are we getting slower? He said, no, no, we, we did as many. Actually, we're upping covers a little bit. It's this new hostess. She really knows how, how where to put people and how to seat people and how to get them <laughs> to accept a seat that's not a window seat. And, and I'm like, I have to meet this woman. And that was my wife. So when I met Lori, um, I was very impressed um, with her sense, just genuine sense for people in, in a deep desire to please, but also her incredible work ethic. So Lori and I married, we worked together in the business. Any yeah. restaurant that I ever owned, she was my front of the house. Wow. Um, she was our front of the house at dressing room. Paul referred to her as the pistol. Um, <laughs> but when, when we were raising Courtney and her older sister, Lauren, and at first our, our firstborn son, Chris, in the first restaurant my wife and I, I owned together called Mishmash, our kids were there. Good they name. were there 
at the restaurant with us. They would help seat people and carry menus to the table. They would work our gospel brunch. They would get up and sing at the gospel brunch. But they, they were raised, and you know how this is, Joan Shaw, yeah. when you're constantly in, in this business of serving people and hospitality and tasting and, and entertaining and welcoming people to your business, welcoming people to your home, there, there's a magic in the human connection if your hospitality yes. is genuine. If it's genuine, if it comes, comes from the most important place, right? And so it wasn't intentional. They were, they, I think they just absorbed our way of life because they were such a big part of it. That's you know, right. We, we didn't believe it at the time and didn't feel right about leaving our kids with nannies. So we had them in, in the restaurant. We did their homework in the basement office. We, you know, we just, they were raised in the business and they learned at, at an early age that, you know, Paul Newman isn't any more important than, than, than Susan Smith, you know, who lives down the street, that, that every customer, everybody that walks through your door, you have this responsibility uh, to make, make sure that they leave happier and in a much better place than when they walk through the door and enter your place right you know so i i just think and and i think some of it is it's in the blood it's natural it's part of the dna um you know they all have it my much to my chagrin my 23 year old son uh drew now wants to want is is cooking and wants to become a chef so <laughs> i love it well yeah, that crazy. means you've done a lot of things right because if they all gravitate around the both of you to do somehow what a form of what you were doing mm. it's a great acknowledgement to how great you are at it so well done mm. now i just uh michelle served the the chardonnay because oh. i know and courtney loves chardonnay as well we've had a few yes, whites does. together too and i would love for you if you could to tell us more about whole some crave mm. and what you've done because you know, again, entrepreneurship at the highest level, doing something amazing for others, providing a need to people most in need, and then building a business. So mm. it's, a, it's a true triple win. So thank you for, for if you don't mind, exploring that for, for everyone. No, of course I will. But first, I will just say that this Chardonnay is spectacular. That, that, that this kind of peachy apricotty thing with just such juicy a city. It's really wonderful, man. It's really good. Thank you. Coming from you, we honor it. <laughs> it's, it's delicious. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, okay, so Wholesome Crave, you know, it's interesting. We, I, I had told you that with Wholesome Wave, we were able to prove the economic benefit that people... Yep actually change their behavior and would buy and eat more healthy food if they had the resources right. to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And we succeeded with policy change. So in 2018, um, when we were successful making the doubling of food stamps permanent in the farm bill, Wholesome Wave and so many of our partners and peer organizations out in the field doing this work worked really hard to basically change history, really spectacular achievement. Yeah. But as, as I had mentioned before, it still, still wasn't enough. So I, I was struggling a little bit personally and professionally. So we had a, just how, how big the problem was and how hard it is to, when you're in a nonprofit, constantly asking people for money. You're always, it's, like yeah. being in, it's like being in series A Groundhog Day. You know, um, you're, you, you wake up in the morning, you ask people for money, you go to bed at night, you ask people for money. Um, so we're in the strategic plan trying to figure out how we can make it to the next few levels, because we now have a vision of having Medicare and Medicaid benefits cover healthy food choices so that people can actually prevent diseases like diabetes and heart disease that affect people in poverty more than anybody else, right? That's yeah. our concept. That's, that's a really big idea. Fantastic um, so, concept. So our, our strategic planning guy said to me, well, you know, Michelle, you're, always, you're fretting about how to raise enough money to do this thing. He's like, and you know, when, when the lease was up on your restaurant, 
you didn't renew it because you put yourself all into Wholesome Wave. Did you ever think about getting back into the food business? There's this guy you might have heard of him. His name is Paul Newman. You know, he makes food and sells it and has given away over a half a billion dollars. Uh, so it was it was funny. You know, he he of course he knew I knew who Paul was, but he was making the point that there were yeah. other ways and and had asked why I hadn't kind of used um, you know, my network and, and my business chops to basically do what Paul did. And, and so, so I did, I, uh, I did some research. I went out into the field to try to figure out where we would belong if I wanted to do a food brand. Uh, des I decided pretty early on that it wasn't going to be in the grocery store for now. When I did research it, uh, on, on, on food products in the grocery store, very many wise friends of mine who know the business well basically told me um, to semi quote the late uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, that the aisles of the grocery stores are littered with the bleach bones of failed celebrity food brands. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you have you have Newman's own. They did well. Bob's Red Mill did did well. There are a few brands that did well, but for every every brand, celebrity food brand that has done well, there are 10 or 15 that have utterly failed. So, That's right. you know, it, and it's just so it's such an expensive game to play with the slotting fees and everything. So, so uh, I, I had spoken with a friend of mine who lives out in California by you all. His name is Fidel Bauchio. He's the mm -hmm. CEO of Bon Appetit Management Company. Mm. So they, they, they helped set up the food program at Google Mountain View, 50,000 employees that eat almost three meals a day. Uh, and he said, you know, Michelle, where there's a real opportunity, he said, with what you did with Heartbeat Restaurant and Pure Restaurant in India, you, you did such great plant-based food because I had a plant-based component to both of those restaurants. Uh, and if you can do that, and if you can do it in soup, there's a huge demand Mm. That there's a big gap between the supply and demand for us to be able to get plant-based soup that's yeah. really good to these enlightened eaters who understand the environmental impact of meat production and all that stuff, and then have the clear give back that you have because of the amazing work you guys have been able to accomplish with Wholesome Wave. That's right. I think if you if you did that, you might you might be onto something. So we created Wholesome Crave. Um, and it's, it's modeled after Newman's Own. What a lot of people don't know about the Newman's Own model is there, there are two entities. There is, the, there is the 501c3 private foundation, Newman's Own Foundation, and, fi and Newman's Own Inc., which is the for-profit company that, that designs and sells the food in, in the grocery store. I see. And that company licenses the name Newman's Own from the foundation for gross revenue royalty. So uh, because that IP of Paul's name has value, they can license it and then they don't that's have right. to pay taxes if it comes out of gross profit. So that's, that's how they Never. give everything away. So Wholesome Crave is modeled very similarly uh, to Newman's own. We're not in the grocery store, we're in scaled food service. So we're in universities, hospitals, and large employers right now. Very we're growing. Clever. We're still kind of in startup mo mode, but we're we're getting traction. <laughs> I think you're beyond startup. And congratulations for going after this channel that mm. needed to be looked after, uh, as much as uh, the consumer side of just purely the brand, the product on the shelf. Mm. Now, Michel, you've lived in India. You've lived and been all around the world, so you know all the continents there is. And I'm going to ask you a, a tough question here. Why do we still have people going hungry every night? And furthermore, children, as we all know, you said the staggering number of the United States. And we're very active with food bank, food centers. We donate as a winery millions of dollars a year for that cause. Why do we still have people going hungry today in the world? Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, Jean-Charles, I just need to be, you know, boldly blunt about it. Uh, it's, it's the human condition. Um, there's so much, so much greed in the world. And it's not just around finances or money. It's, it's around power. 
um, yeah. you know, in it, it, you you it, you look at any place in the world where hunger and poverty exists, and it exists amongst populations who, if they were left alone, <laughs> um, most are farmers. You know, uh, almost eighty percent of the smallholder farmers in the world outside of the United States are women, and they're hmm. they're they're completely exploited. They're raising. Oh. Some of our most important crops, pulses and legumes, and and they're basically being paid pennies a day um, for their crops. And the brokers and the people in the middle, with what they upcharge in the export markets, by the time it finally ends up to the end consumer, all of the money is being made there. You know, it's just that 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 whole notion of exploitation. Um, is is what has most people in the world in a position of poverty. When we look at some of the land grabs in South America, um, you know, for Chinese soy markets and 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 you know other raw materials, where there would be indigenous peoples who had been existing and thriving for millennia. <laughs> um, and then one day the bulldozer shows up and the government says, this is our land, get off of it, or we're going to bulldoze you down in your, in, in your villages, you have to leave. And then they end up in the, the slums of Sao Paulo, um, where they can't grow their own food, they can't catch their own fish, they can't raise a healthy family and teach them uh, the, the ways of their culture. I mean, this is, you know, that's, that's how, that's where most of the poverty comes from, from out, outside of. Um, yeah. you know, developed countries, but it, a lot of it comes down to exploitation and, and it, it, it's unfortunate, um, you know, and I, I think what we tried to do with Wholesome Wave and, and we will tr continue to try to do it until I draw my last breath is prove <laughs> that when you take, yeah. you know, a billion people in the world who are going to bed hungry tonight and you organize the economy in a way where they have the resources they need to actually go out and purchase and buy and make the choices to get the food to feed their family well, that's a big marketplace for food. Why are yep. we depriving them of that resource? There's plenty of money in the middle. <laughs> for sure. Um, to pay more fair prices for the crops that we're taking right now. Uh, from these women landholders, right? And some of them aren't even holding their land anymore. People take it from them and then they have to lease it back, lease back the land that used to belong to their family. It's just crazy. So I, I, it's like, if we could wave the magic wand, John Charles, get everybody a glass of Chardonnay um, <laughs> and, and have them just rethink for themselves, how much is enough? Yeah. And answer that question and make sure that there's plenty for everybody else, but in a way that they're, Dig dignity, dignified, fair market price for an agricultural product. You can send your kids to school. <laughs> you can buy the equipment that you need uh, to, to expand your land and your business operation and have a viable small business. I, I'd love to wave that magic wand and have everybody tomorrow be able to provide for themselves and their family. Everybody, want, I, I, I haven't met anybody who doesn't want to do that unless they're suffering from some kind of mental illness, frankly. Yeah. No, I agree. And so my magic one is going to be the Pinot. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'm going to go for Pinot as you, mm. as you suggested. Mm. So how do you recommend, Michelle, because you were extremely visionary to do it, to help, to activate it, to execute it. You build a plan for it. You build your life around it. You build your family around this. How can everyone, do you think, make a difference to help contribute, alleviate, in some shape or form, the issues of hunger around the world? Any recommendation for all of us? And again, we have friends from Asia. We have friends from Europe, Africa, and obviously all the Northern Afri American area here with us tonight. Yeah, I think... You know, Jean Charles, it's um, when you look at the amount of money that goes into philanthropy. Um, you know, people people who have done well and have made that decision to be generous, and they 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 give they give back. Your 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 company gives millions of dollars to food relief yep. organizations every year. The notion of being able to maybe aggregate 
global philanthropy in a way that it provides the technical assistance training and 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 frankly grants for equipment <laughs> for smallholder farmers to be able to improve their agri agricultural production so they can get they can get better yields um, so they have access to to low cost financing uh, but get the technical assistance to really understand how to run their a business so that they can more directly and and entrepreneurially engage with the marketplace, right? Yeah, that's that's the type of education that's not happening. It's you know, if you're going to give the money away anyway, the world of philanthropy, the the global world of philanthropy mm -hmm. at large, if we aggregated and organized it in ways that you you treat the recipients as though they're going you want them to be a successful borrower you give them the technical assistance and the training that they need they get the grant money to improve their operation but now they know how to run a business um, that type of support uh, could really go a long way uh, because again it's you, you look at you know all of the millions of of, of smallholder farmers in the world. I'm just using agriculture because that, that's where we have a lot of our chops here in the US. Just those are classic small businesses in any society. Um, they're, they're the bedrock foundation of what defines our culture. Uh, another thing that, that I like to say is the food that, that we, we grow and tend and harvest then cook and serve with love in the place we call home defines us. So that, that works in Suriname, that works in India, that works in Cambodia, mm -hmm. you know, those smallholder farmers, classic small businesses, they're making culture possible. These nations and, and the folks that are doing well financially and have done well in the financial markets kind of have a responsibility to use their philanthropy in a way that that isn't just kind of sticking a finger in the dike or making sure somebody can feed their family a meal tonight. But they have that they have the tools, they have the yeah. economic understanding, and they have the resources available so that they can actually become self-reliant, self-sufficient on their own. It's just an idea. It's a great one. So, dear friends, everybody needs to go onto Michelle's website, and it's obviously in the chat mm -hmm. as we speak. And mm -hmm. you've heard the name many times: the man creating the waves. <laughs> Always remember that wholesale wave. Now. Michelle, you are a James Beard winner, not just once, not just twice, mm. not just three times, I mean, four times. Mm. Is anyone got it four times in a row like you have? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, they're, they're, I think, um, you know, we, I think Rick Bayless has close to a dozen. Courtney, how, how many does Jacques have? Do we know? Uh, I think like 17. Yeah, it's like Jacques, I think Jacques has like 17. But, you know, well, he, he is a little uh, older than me, so I, I, can, yes. I, can catch, I can catch up. No, uh, hey, you have three decades. He has three decades <laughs> over you. <laughs> no, so, um, you know, they're, um, they're, it's, not, it's not easy uh, uh, to get one. So I'm very, very, very proud of them. Um, sure. But I, I would say that, you know, for every award I have, if I, ha I, 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 I have 10 colleagues who deserve one, that just haven't been able to get on the radar, um, you know. So they 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 clearly are a wonderful validation, um, especially, you know, two two of the awards specifically were, um, you know, for my work in sustainability, uh, in the storytelling, the uh, around the topics that that you and I are discussing this evening. Um, it it's 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 nice to have. Um, oh, sure. But, I, but I, I would love to I would love to turn them into a grant program with technical assistance for smallholder farmers in Asia. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why well I could said. do that. You know, if I could do that, that would be awesome. Well, you've got many other awards. So which one besides this one you wish to share as an amazing award that can inspire others to to follow you in your footsteps? Because oh. you're such a great leader and inspiration. And I think we all aspire to do things differently. We need to be shown the way. And you were fortunate, your parents, as you've mentioned, your education, your kids following you and your lovely wife in hospitality. 
your dynasty a legacy in this world, but not everyone is as fortunate. So is there another award you, you've gotten you wish to share that really shaped you who you are today? Well, I think one that actually um, really helped motivate me and convince me that, that we're on the right track with our approach. Uh, we, Fast Company uh, does, yeah. you know, sometimes every other year, sometimes every year they do, they do like the, the game changing ideas award. And, and a few years back, there were, there were 12 companies that they named as the 12, 12 world changing ideas. And, and it was the fruit and vegetable prescription program concept that I was talking to you about what motivated me to create wholesome wave and eventually wholesome crave is that two of Courtney's brothers have type one diabetes. So mm -hmm. my oldest son, Chris was diagnosed, you know, 26 years ago, 27 years ago, uh, when he was five years old with type one diabetes. And we learned almost immediately that what we would do with, with Chris's food philosophy and, and approach at home would have more to do with the length and the quality of his life than anything else. We took it very seriously, obviously. And, and it, it really was the depression of understanding there were millions of American families who also face diabetes that don't have the resources or the knowledge that Lori and I had so their children, they're, they're basically destined to be bear, to bury their children when it's supposed to be the other way around. So, mm -hmm. you know, that when, when I, when we started doubling food stamps for fruits and vegetables, and I learned that the people on the agriculture committees actually weren't really interested in whether it improved people's health or not. I was a little disappointed because no. that actually was the goal. It's like, how do we get the financial resources that someone could buy the fruits and vegetables they need to add to their diet so that they can lengthen the life of their children, right? Um, that's, that, that, that's why I founded Wholesome Wave. And when I learned that nobody cared about health outcomes, I was a little bummed out. So when we created the fruit and vegetable prescription program, that really does require you need a doctor to say, hey, you know, before somebody gets the type two diabetes, you know, you, you need to lose some weight, exercise a little more. You need to eat more fruits and vegetables. Here's a prescription for the fruits and vegetables you need. And then it, to continue to have your prescription refilled, you have to come back every few months, just like if you were given a Stanton for your heart disease. That's right. You have to come back and your doctor has to check your vitals and make sure you're doing progress. And then you can renew your prescription. If you stop seeing the doctor, you, you don't get to renew the prescription. So we created that concept as a target for Medicare and Medicaid. And when Fast Company called us out, that said to me, this is, this is an idea that, that we need to really leverage to get the attention of healthcare payers, healthcare providers, businesses. This is no longer a philanthropic endeavor. This is something where good health can be good business. So, so that, right. that, that was an important award because it, it really kind of said, yeah, you guys are a nonprofit doing philanthropic work, but the idea is a world changer if we can get these other businesses to adopt it, right? And that's, we're making progress with that. We're making progress. It's, it take, I, these are big systems. So sometimes it takes time, but we're, we're making progress. And this, this is an oil is delicious, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm ahead of you on this one. <laughs> I'm drinking faster than you are, but what I'll you're saying is, is, is amazing. And thank you so much for not only being honest, but sharing. Now, before I ask you the next question, what do you think? I know Pinot is one of your loves. So what do you think? I, I just made a rosé. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you're welcome to blend. A, the rosé of the 69 is Pinot anyhow. So you, you did a Franco-American blend. It is good. <laughs> now, hang on a second. Okay, so the Pinot Noir, let's take, talk about this. Debonair, charismatic, and like you, seductive. Ah, you're too kind. It, I'll speak about what my wife said, Gina, after we met you. She said, 
He's so articulate, so convincing, so charismatic mm. and seductive. So that's the impact you had on my lovely wife. Oh my, oh my goodness. Well, yes. Gina is, is, is quite, quite the uh, businesswoman and wine efficient out of herself. That's quite, quite a compliment. This is really, really delicious. And it, it is just so, so, so complex, so drinkable now. But it, it it also tastes like you can cellar this for quite some time. It's got That's right. it's got really good shoulders in the tannin, which is terrific. But the fruit like steps right up to the plate and matches it. It's really spectacular. I love it. Thank you. And it's you're right. It's 2018, so young vintage, and uh, you know the heart of Sonoma Coast. So all about what you are now. Is there Michelle a dream that you may have that you wish to share? that maybe you haven't yet achieved um yeah actually i i i you know it's it is so it's it and it's a it's, it's a selfish dream i love mm -hmm. i love music uh i am a musician it's actually what i wanted to be when my mother talked me into getting a job in a restaurant because when i was a musician in a band in chicago called scoundrel we were popular but it didn't pay well. So I was living in a two bedroom apartment with three other people. Um, and it was really, really tough. Um, so that, that's when my mom is like, get that job in the restaurant. And eventually I was able to rent my own apartment. I got a free meal a day and I got a paycheck and all of that. But I, I always missed the music industry um, a lot. And so, you know, one of, one of my dreams would be to, if we could have, 48 to 72 hours in a day. Um, yeah. And I, I actually am pretty serious about this. Yeah, me too. If, if I we, agree. If we actually could do that so that I could do both, um, I would be really, really happy. I've been blessed over my life and my career to meet some, some and have some really good friends in the music industry. And I know that they approach their music the way you and I approach food and wine and service and and they're very philanthropic I mean Will, Willie Nelson and what he's done with Farm Aid you know with with John Mayer and 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 yeah. Neil Young and everybody I, I just you know I, I I really wish I had the time to do both because I, I, I believe if I would have played all of these years and had the time to continue to pick the instruments up, I'd be really awesome right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you are. Now, yeah. um, you have uh, the Dalai Lama behind you. Oh, yes. And I okay. would assume you've met him before. Yes. Is there any... Anything you want to share with this great image you have? Because it's yeah. a beautiful frame at your home there. Oh, thank what you. What a gorgeous house. Yeah, well, thank you. And also, so so these the the other art behind me is by Jacques Pepin. A lot of people don't know that Jacques actually is an accomplished artist as wow. well. But this this one is from from uh, Peter Max, the American folk artist. And uh, we did uh, in 1999, I had opened Heartbeat Restaurant. Uh, in the first W Hotel. It was a restaurant of well-being, local, organic, sustainable, but no butter, no cream, no flour, no sugar. And Love it. How, how do you make food delicious? Well, we got, <laughs> we got three stars in the New York Times and got, got zero stars in the New York Post and accused of being the food police, but we are controversial, so very busy. Um, the food and, police, I love it. Yeah, yeah it's so funny. Uh, it, it, it was a wonderful restaurant and... Um, you know, we um, one of the things that we did in the hotel because the the original concept for W was Urban Oasis. So we did a number of philanthropic events at the hotel. Uh, we we looked at the space release policy, and when we weren't doing weddings or we weren't doing you know big corporate events and things like that, and we knew we had blocks of rooms we would offer this awesome space up to a variety of others. So, so there's a gentleman from the music industry named Shep Gordon, um, who is also known as Supermensch. So Mike Myers, the comedian, did a documentary on Shep called Supermensch. Oh, um, wonderful, wonderful guy. But whenever His Holiness would come to the United States um, to speak or do events, 
Shep would organize everything for him because Shep repped Luther Vandross, Alice Cooper, really very well respected in the business. So when His Holiness came in 1999 to do the big Central Park um, gathering, we, we did a fundraiser at the W Hotel. Uh, and and here, here's the lineup. Here are the chefs. Myself, Roger Verger, mm. Rola Gassi, Jean-Georges Van Richten, uh, Daniel Baloud, Nobu Matsuhisa, <laughs> Mark Tarbell, Carrie Simon, this was that it was we all did this dinner. So who uh, is who in the chef world? Yeah, three, three, three hundred people and raised eight million dollars for free Tibet. So um, Peter Max, I'll tell you the story about this. So this is one of the one hundred and eight Dalai Lamas. And the reason why there are one hundred and eight is because P Peter asked, um, said to Shep, we're wow, cool. We're going to do this fundraiser with Michelle. Uh, I got an idea for auction items. I, I'll paint, I'll do a bunch of images of his holiness, find out what his favorite number is and whatever it is, that's how many I'll do. <laughs> and he thought it was going to be like 12, you know, or seven. Like it was not 13,969. Yeah, it was, it was, it was 108 because that's how many prayer beads are in it. That's a, right. A prayer bracelet. I got it. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so uh, I, I'm very, very fortunate to have, wow. have one of those. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. And I think you have the same Saj profile as the Dalai Lama. In uh, a I don't know about way. that. <laughs> so I think you conduct the same type of power. Yeah. So, Michelle, I really want to thank you so much. You know, oh, we so became instantaneous friends. It was a few, three weeks ago when we were in New Orleans. I was actually with your friend Emeril Lagas, as you know, that evening. Oh, of course. Em Emeril and you were was at this dinner too. I, I forgot to mention him. Emeril cooked it at, at the Dalai Lama dinner as well. Yeah, you were yourself leading uh, the chair of uh, the Amazon environmental. Uh, yeah, Amazon conservation team. So they... Yeah. That an amazing organization that has now preserved over 90 million acres in, in the Amazon in That's four fantastic. countries are recognized as belonging to the indigenous tribes who inhabit them. So they're, they're safe from development. It's, it's really pretty remarkable the way that they work. And that's the way we should, we should look at the world. I, I in order to have a correct toast, I need to have the amount of wine in my glass. <laughs> so Michelle, I'm going to ask you the last, uh, I know we've been over an hour together and I'm okay. abusing of your precious time. And your daughter who is with us is probably saying, Michelle, that's it, that's it. No, 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 no. She, look, Courtney, Courtney is, is happy for these conversations to take as long as they need. Well, and I hope she comes and say hi at the end. I really would like you, you're such a sage, you have such a philosophical way of looking at the world and, and we don't know each other too well, but I've read a lot about what you do, been very impressed about your entrepreneurship or what you've done in your life. Uh, would you leave us, you know, we are mid-December, you know, it's a critical time, change of new year soon. We are rethinking, always reevaluating reassessing, rethinking who we are and what we do. Maybe you give us a few words of what you think we should all think about between now and the end of the year, as we then attack 2022 mm. with fervence and dynamism and energy. I think we, we should just think of others. We should just think of others. We, I, I think, you know, Joan Shalom and so many of us and so many, we're, you and I are both graced to know so many amazing professionals yep. in our industry and other industries that we encounter as a result of what we do. And yep. we know plenty of people who know who they are. They know who they are and, and they have a pretty good idea of where they're going. Mm. Um, the, one, the one thing that, that often conspires against anybody who is busy, who is successful, um, who is focused is just taking a couple of steps back and thinking of others. I mean, other than your family, we, we, we all have our families dialed in, 
to the best extent that we can of thinking of others, right? Um, in our business decisions, uh, in, our, in our philanthropic decisions, in, in decisions we make in a, in a product that we might purchase, you know, that, you know, is, is this a product that, that we're buying because the price is right and it's really awesome? Or is it a product that we're purchasing because, you know, the price is maybe a little bit more, but it's helping, uh, you know, a young, um, a black, a Native American, a smallholder farmer, entrepreneur, have a successful business so that their family can have a good holiday too. Um, you know, just, I, I think we should all just take a step back, take a beat, think of others and, 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 and make a decision to do something for them. You know, it could be, yeah. it could be the easiest thing. It could be, you know, one, one of the things that my mom used to do when we were growing up is a new neighbor would come into the neighborhood and she would immediately go into baking the cookie mode frying the chicken mode and making the dumplings mode. And she wanted to be the first person at the door of the new neighbor with a big box full of ready to go food. Wow. Because she knew they're in a new place. They don't know anybody. They're probably unpacked. They're wondering, they don't even know where to go to try to get food. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, let's take this off of their plate. Let's just do my mom was always thinking of others, always thinking of others. And, and I think, and, and, and my mother-in-law was very similar too. It's just when, when, they, when they left the world, it, it was hard to not find somebody who wasn't crying, you know, um, at, at the loss because they were just such genuine, generous people. So, so I think, you know, it, in, in the spirit of the new year that we're facing, Let's think of others and do something about it. Oh, so well said. You're giving me shivers and excitements and <laughs> willing to jump out of the window and... and it, it's the Pinot Noir. <laughs> <laughs> so well said, uh, Michelle. I mean, what could we add but just to echo and, and do what you just said? Yeah. And if we all do this, the world will be a better place. Indeed. And to your mother, and I know you shared the dumpling recipe, which is your favorite Yes. when we were together so well done and i commend you to coordinate to you to your other children to your wife to your whole family to to what you're building with whole cell wave and wholesome wave and all that you've done with paul newman and all what you're doing yeah, from restaurants you. to venues to providing great foods to google to all those great companies this is amazing yeah well, so, thank you Michelle, so much, Michelle. I'm at the Oakville Grocery in the museum. I hope you come and see us and you help us to change the world of the Oakville Grocery at some stage. Yeah, I, know. I, I, I can't wait to see it. I will be there. And just for anybody who's viewing us and following, it is our, our big end of the year drive at Wholesome Wave. So if you go to wholesomewave.org, you can help us reach our goal of providing a quarter million um, servings of fruits and vegetables to people in need before the end of the year. So That's there you have an opportunity to think of others. There you go. And I, right. I, I love the Oakville Grocery. I can't wait to see you there and your product in it and to see Gina again to you and yours, Jean-Charles. Thank, thank you, you Michelle. For the delicious wine and for the conversation. And to our friend, Dickie Bueno. Yes. We met indeed. each other thanks to him. So yes. thank you, Dickie. We can, we can blame Dickie. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers.